Nobody got kicked out. Excellent. <laughs> I didn't get a pop up. No, because you're the one oh, pressing. Gotcha. You have the power. I have, you have the power. I have, I have the recording power. Okay, there we go. So yes, again, everybody, welcome to our recipe development 101 workshop uh, presented by Canola Eatwell. We're so glad to have everybody here. Um, lots of things to cover. So I'm just going to hand it right off to Jennifer McKenzie. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. I'm eager to hear your questions. I hope the workshop was informative and I hope you all, has everybody watched it? Um, and what we'll do is, I don't entirely know uh, the entire list of who's from what school. So I don't know if you have one sort of representative asking the questions. I know you uh, suggested to prepare some questions. So I'll just go start going around um, with, uh, you know, the way you appear on my screen. And if you're not the person with the question in your group, you can just shout out to who is. Uh, we can use the chat function as well. If somebody um, has asked a question from another school and you have a follow-up to that, um, feel free to punch that into the chat and I'll, I'll try and keep an eye on that so that we're not repeating the same topics, you know, at when we get around to your turn for the question. I think that'll help keep things moving. Um, if you need to raise your hand, does everybody know how to do that? Raise your hand. Oh no, that was, I was clapping. Um, raise your hand that way and then um, we can, uh, you know, get get to you if um if we uh if we don't see your mention in the chat or anything so we're going to be fairly informal lynn weaver is our expert on canola so anything canola and nutrition um related you can address to lynn she'll chime in uh i've got the recipe development um sabrina has the rules and regulations in regards to recipe development uh and then we can uh we don't have our photographer here tonight but we can um sabrina and i can probably help um field your and if, if you have any photography questions uh that aren't too high tech <laughs> so um feel free um now i have uh on the top of my screen renee which school are you from yeah, my name's uh renny chauvin i'm the uh i'm the culinary uh I guess you can say lead. No, no, it's too arrogant. I, I'm there. I'm the Centennial College uh, professor. So I have uh, Samantha Meat, and we have uh, uh, Gino. And where's my other student here? She was here. There she is, Molly White. So we have right. those four students. Oh, great! Yes, because you have two teams, right? Yeah, you know what? We needed to double the odds just to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great students i believe uh they they have the bank of questions so i'm just okay like, like you need help winning uh renee like you help me like you need help winning <laughs> well hey listen i don't know if everyone knows here but keith is running this event coming up this saturday at thistletown collegiate go i think that is the premier food event in the city of toronto in any year it's amazing event and what he does i just want to put a shout out for that there you go thanks chef we got uh, we got 24 chefs coming it's going to be great and of course centennial's coming and i always look forward to the great stuff you're making yep. thank you wonderful Cheers. what a great community okay so samantha molly who else was it Gino. and meat so who has the questions? Um, in regards to plate styling, um, would you recommend more uh, longer plates or being able to use a larger plate to build up layers? You know, for photography, it's, um, it can be complicated because sometimes if you just have everything stacked, um, you know, a, a smaller plate and you're, you're going high, it's harder to capture that the look right so it's not like somebody sitting at the table um you might want to play with the angles i'm going to use my ipad here so if the if the plate's like this you might want to do your 
your photography from from an angle rather than overhead if you go with a stacked. Um, I think the biggest thing that we've seen in, in past years of the competition is we want to see all of those elements. So um, sometimes that stacking hides some of the elements and and when you when we did things in person, you know, sometimes it would be presented in front of the judges. And if it's too much stacked, they're kind of trying to go, okay, where's the, you know, such and such, you know, they're trying to look at the different elements. Um, so sometimes uh, a larger, you know, kind of plate is, is better for, uh, for a, a more in your face presentation when you're talking about photography. So, um, you know, maybe play with a couple of different things and, and um, you know, plate two different ones and take two different photos because a lot of times I find what looks great in person doesn't necessarily um, get captured as well depending on your photography angle. So um, definitely take different angles, do some overhead, do some sort of, a, you know, face on um, and then maybe even do two different platings for your photo. The other thing to consider when you have a plate, um, like, you know, I know that with professional plating, right, in a restaurant, food service, height is always such a great element, right? And they're teaching, teaching you that in school quite a bit. Just something to consider is that the angle, right, like Jennifer is saying, because the higher your plate is, the further back your camera has to be in order to get it all in the frame, right? So you're going to lose the detail and the interest because you're so far back. Then the other thing you need to consider is that the farther back you are, the more background you're going to have. So um, just make sure that whatever you're using as your set, like where you're placing your plate to take your picture, that there's not too much background noise going on. So if you're taking it in the kitchen or you ha just have something to block out the things that aren't supposed to be in the picture, and then you want to think about how it's going to bounce the light and how the color of your backdrop could complement or distract from your actual subject, your plate. So just take all of those into consideration. So just because it looks good in real life that way, to Jennifer's point, it may not translate to a photo because you have to consider, again, the, the frame of the, and the composition and, and the background. And shadows actually get quite yeah. tricky when you have... Um, high tall tall food you get some weird shadows and and then it everyone's kind of like what is that and it's not an element of the plate it's actually a shadow it's your hand holding the phone <laughs> yeah your hand <laughs> i'm pretty sure we saw that in the workshop and that was not until that one that was quite funny <laughs> So any other questions from Centennial? Um, the only other one was uh, with styling pictures, are we allowed to use like props to really make it more enhance and make it pop? You know what, whatever you think makes the food, you know, the food has to be the star, obviously. And to Sabrina's point about, you know, too much distraction, but sometimes a prop or, um, you know, a little bit of propping kind of makes it more enticing. Um, you do want to focus on where your eye goes to though. So if you have a really fabulous, you know, spectacular prop, but maybe it doesn't, you know, it might distract from the food. So um, more subtle is, is usually better on propping when you're talking about your food, you know, for a competition. So my advice is to look through some magazines. So um, look through some magazines. Instagram, I find these days there's so much propping. It's, it's insane. It seems to be a style which, you know, can work for Instagram, I guess, but for a food competition where the food and the ingredients are really needing to be important, um, sometimes too much propping, you know, just detracts from that. And my last question was, um, so for, I, I can speak for meat and I, this is our first time actually fully in labs and really getting to play with flavors and actually getting to take the actual steps. Um, where would be a good place with menu developing to know where to start and where to stop? <laughs> well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> um, you know, I think when when you're thinking about recipe development, you um, you want to you think about your end results. So, I mean, obviously, you think about your key ingredients. So, I you know would always go with maybe two or three key ingredients. 
um, when I'm designing a dish. Uh, if you get up to seven and eight key ingredients, they can fight with each other. Obviously, you have accent ingredients, and those accent ingredients need to highlight your key ingredients. And because we're using Canadian ingredients with global influence, I would suggest, obviously, we it's 60%, right, Sabrina? 60% Canadian. So 60%, that means, you know, at least two of your key ingredients need to be Canadian. Um, and then your, you know, your 40% can be those, those global influences. But I would definitely choose sort of, you know, two or three really key ingredients, and then use those other ingredients to highlight and showcase those, those keys. And um, so probably you're going to have a protein um, and you're going to have your veg. And I would say your starch is, um, you know, probably going to be an accent. Um, and then your seasonings are going to be the accents. And that's something that your instructors, you know, can guide you on. But definitely um, think about those, those stars. So you've got your stars and your accents. All right. Thank you very much. And anyone else from Centennial? Nope. Okay. You know, Patrick, you're Fanshawe, right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Somewhere so, in my memory bank. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, good to see you all, and, and thank you for having us uh, uh, again this year. Um, so, unfortunately, one of my students was not able to make it tonight, so I do have a couple questions on their behalf that I, I ask, and then uh, I understand um, our student, uh, other student, Caitlin, has some questions as well. Yeah, I just That's saw okay. that. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I guess the question I was wondering about was, uh, we were talking about, is the lead. I guess any any other tips you could provide on on the written lead in or description? Uh, like I understand, you know, things about not being too playful. Are there any particular things uh, that you don't want to see or that you'd like to see? Um, well, or any other advice? <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's the judges. I mean, the, the list, yeah. of, you know, it's all, it's judged. So it's depending mm -hmm. on what the judges want. Sure. And it's yeah. subjective. But that's, a, that's actually a really, really good question because mm -hmm. what, um, in recipe development, what that's your sales pitch. So your lead right. is your sales pitch. So I come from a magazine and cookbook background. And when people are looking through a magazine or a cookbook, they're flipping, flipping, flipping. They're going to look at the title, right? So mm -hmm. first the thing they look at, well, first they're going to look at the picture. Um, they're going to look at the title. They're going to say, okay, in that title, are those ingredients that I like. So if it's bison with potatoes and, uh, you know, a blueberry um, juniper soup sauce. Sure. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's, you know, that's intriguing. Mm -hmm. Men in the lead or intro to the recipe, tell me why I want to make this. So it's like writing a menu for a restaurant. Mm -hmm. You know, in the restaurant, you, you try and capture that dish in those few lines um, on the menu to entice people to order that. Well, in the magazine or in the cookbook, you have a couple of extra lines, but that's your sales pitch. This is telling me as my home, as a home cook, um, and that's what actually we, we meant to address that. So these recipes should be sort of, they could be for, you know, higher end, but for your avid home cook. So you're targeting your avid, you know, care foodie person that, that likes to cook adventurous things at home and obviously likes to cook in Canadian ingredients. So definitely mention what's fabulous about your ingredients. Um, mention what's fabulous about this dish in particular, because I've cooked potatoes before, I've cooked bison before, maybe the blueberry juniper is new. So tell me why I want to make that dish and, you know, and what's great about it. So that's your sales pitch. Um, definitely keep it concise. Don't list the entire ingredients because I can read that ingredients list, right. but definitely tell me um, what, what's great about that particular recipe for these ingredients. And also if there's anything special or a twist or um, something tricky, about this recipe um, that you can in, 
include that in the intro as well and then or in the tips if it's really technical and say you know instead of using sous vide you can do this in the oven that goes in the tip so that's that's a more technical thing but if you want to tell people where to find a certain ingredient you know look at a specialty spice shop for the juniper berries because when I'm reading that question, um, when I'm reading that recipe, I'm looking at the title and my first thing might be go, hmm, well, juniper, juniper sounds intriguing, but where would I get them? So if you've been told me in the intro and then I'm like, oh, okay, I might be inclined to make that recipe. If you haven't told me where that, you know, sort of more obscure ingredient is from, I might just gloss over and go, oh, no idea about the juniper berries, flip the page, go to a next recipe where I am I'm more familiar with the ingredients. So when you're talking to the home cook versus the restaurant, you know, patron, um, the restaurant patron doesn't need to know where to find the juniper berries. They just need to know that they're delicious. Um, right. So the home cook needs to know how they're going to incorporate that and bring that, bring that to, you know, to their kitchen. Okay. Well, that's great. Thank you. And the second question they had related to uh, the balance of Canadian versus uh, international flavors and ingredients, and you've already kind of addressed that as well, then I, I think that's helpful knowing to if you keep the protein as the uh, Canadian ingredient, I think, and then the yeah. supporting flavors as your, your multicultural, your international flair, then, then, then yeah, I, think I mean, it, it, it certainly doesn't have to be that proportion, but when we're talking about 60% Canadian mm -hmm. um, and 40%, I mean, certainly, you know, if you wanted something that wasn't Canadian, fortunately, we have amazing array of protein um, mm -hmm. that is Canadian, but, um, you know, I, I wouldn't, I'm trying to even think of a protein that's, you know, that we don't have here. Um, emu, you know, mm -hmm. uh, although I think we have emu farms, <laughs> oddly enough. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so I think, I think that's a good, a good way to go because that's probably going to be one of your stars, um, you know, is your protein, unless you're going with, with, um, you know, sort of an alternative, but, um, you know, definitely make sure that the, that 60% is Canadian and Sabrina included a list from Canadian food focus. And, um, and it's kind of fascinating how many ingredients we do have that are Canadian and, and sometimes they're maybe not necessarily ones that you think of, but they're, they're growing and producing so many more things here now. Great. Thank you very much. And then uh, Caitlin, I guess if you, if you, if you want to ask your hey, questions. You, are you yes, are you live now, Caitlin? Yeah, Caitlin put in the chat that her mic is down and she can't. Yeah. Question. Okay, can do you I, want to type them in? I sent her a message, but I'm not hearing oh. back from her. So maybe okay, we'll, we'll, on to some, we'll get back to it. And we'll come back to Caitlin. Yeah. Okay, um, who else? I'm, people have, my grid's moving around. So, um, May, May Dawn. And where are you from? Hi, I'm uh, from Fleming. Oh, hi. hi. I'm just up the road. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm here today with my professor, Steve Benz. Hi, Steve Benz. Yeah, Steve Benz. <laughs> and one of my uh, teammates is Tamara. I think she shy. She didn't turn on her cameras. Oh, hi, Tamara. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, um, my questions. Here you go. Here she is. Um, I watched the workshop. Of course, it was amazing. A lot of tips. Uh, really, really good. Like, it's it's just really good. Uh, but one of the thing that I didn't see you mention was about nutrition, and I guess it's maybe just Ali myself who really focus on that or Ooh. yeah <laughs> yeah so uh, my questions is when it comes to um recipe development what it means is nutrition to you if it's clear yeah i mean honestly for for this competition that probably won't be you know a huge consideration of the judges um sabrina the the scoring doesn't include um nutrition but i think from a perspective of presenting a dish that home cooks want to make and that the judges will like 
a good balance is, you know, is important. I think that's kind of come into our consciousness, um, you know, for cus customers in, in restaurants and, you know, home cooks for sure. Um, you know, probably they're not going to have a, you know, um, a 12 ounce piece of protein and three tiny little sprigs of broccoli um, and call that, you know, a balanced meal that they want to make. So I think that's a good question. Um, you know, there are the people that are ordering 32 ounce steak and, you know, um, and having a potato and, and calling that dinner. But um, I think in, if you consider today's lifestyles, people's um, tastes, people's um, sort of consciousness about eating a more balanced diet, that that's a really good thing to include in your recipe. And the judges, you know, like I said, they don't, they don't score on nutrition, but I think that would present as, you know, a, a, an enticing meal um, that people would want to make. And because this is a recipe writing competition, again, I go back to the, you know, is the home cook going to make this recipe that you're submitting? Or is it going to be something that they'll go, oh my goodness, I would never eat, you know, a pound of salmon on my own. Um, and, and then something to definitely consider is the proportion. So um, make it a reasonable proportion for, you know, the number of servings that you're making. Um, with respect to you know, nutrition, you know, it, not special diet or anything, but, but balance. Thank you so much. Any other questions, Tamar? Do you have? Hi. Hi. Um, the question I had was for one of the points in the video that you had was about writing the recipe, um, know your audience. So yes. I'm just wondering, so we write in the language that they'll understand. So are we writing it for the home cook or are we yeah. writing it? Yeah, so for this one, we um, we would say the avid home cook. So um, some, you know, we want, we know you want to bring out your, your best stuff. You're not making, you know, so, um, hammer helper uh, <laughs> kind of kind of recipe, right? So, um, so this is not sort of the busy busy parent trying to get dinner on the table for the toddler. Uh, we don't expect you to cater to them for the recipe because you want to impress us and you want to impress the judges. Um, so, I would say that the avid home cook. So the, the person that you know that, you know, hasn't been to culinary school, but they like to read cookbooks, they like to try different things, they like to experiment with flavors. So um, go for that kind of person. But when you're writing the recipe, you need to make sure that the equipment is stuff that people will have at home. So don't use a combi oven. Probably, you know, if you want to deep fry, you have to be really specific. You can't use, you can't say, put it in the deep fryer um, because people don't have a deep fryer at home necessarily. So you consider what avid cooks would have at home as far as equipment and which language that they'll need. Um, so, you know, for instance, if you just said, you know, deep fry the french fries, is that enough information for, you know, an avid home cook? Probably not. They need the temperature. They need to know for how long. They need to know how big you cut those French fries and you know how fast they'll cook. So that's when we're we're talking about the language. Um, you know, if you told a professional chef deep fry the French fries, they would you know know how to do that. But somebody at home probably hasn't done it very often. Um, however, you could probably tell them to you know julienne the carrot. That's, you know, that's probably, you know, thing that an avid home cook would know how to julienne a carrot. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from Steve? Yeah, I just had one quick one. Um, obviously, a lot of times as chefs, when we do menu development, um, we're doing it on our own. And um, this contest, it's in pairs. And I know you've written some stuff with, uh, with uh, other authors. And is there or other uh, people as well? And is there any advice that you like can the guy, give to like them the guy on how to the guy over like the, the guy sofa? that keeps walking in behind you there? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but but any advice that you could give them on how to how to keep a strong relationship and make sure they're still friends after the process is done? Yeah. 
Yes, or still married, as the case may be. Or still be. married. My, my my husband is uh, is my uh, a previous uh, professional chef and my co-author on a, on a few of our cookbooks. Um, and ironically enough, we have some recipes to develop this week together. So. Um, yeah, that's that's a really good one. So I think communication, obviously, you know, in any relationship, um, whether it's a, a partner of of life or a partner in the kitchen, um, communication and and compromise. Um, you know, I think if people are saying, you know, I think we should add, you know, peaches to this, and and um, and if somebody feels strongly that you know they don't think they should add peaches to that. Um, talking it through and and sort of weighing the pros and cons and and being willing to to give give a little um, we're making a steak this week that has green olives in it jay does not like green olives but <laughs> i won that one um so he'll 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 get to influence something else that we make so um a little you know give and take and uh and talking it through and um and if you both look at it from maybe not your personal perspective so um maybe not what you want but what your your theoretical customer so in this case your theoretical customer is that avid home cook um so it, maybe you have to take it away from your own personal taste to what what your audience is um, is more likely to appreciate about the recipe so if you're talking about an ingredient or an aspect or a cooking technique um, you know maybe take it away from your own your and your partner's own opinion to saying okay well what would be better for the audience so I think that's a, a good way also to remove it from that personal battle um, but also you know talking through things comes up with way better ideas. That's the really neat thing about having a partner is you can come up with way more ideas um, and bounce things off each other. So you can definitely use it to your benefit. Thank you. We have a, we have a question, Kongba. My name is Kongba and uh, we are from Montreal. Uh, I let my student uh, William to, uh, to to ask the question for you. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Hi. So uh, the question is about the cultural use uh, and interpretation of the dish. The what? The, Sorry. Is there a limit of the um, cultural use and interpretation over the dish? Which means, uh, does it okay that uh, let's say I'm a white guy and I. And I do like Asian and create the dish over the plate. Is is this um, is this authorized by the organization or? Uh... As far, so I'll take this one, Jennifer. Um, as yeah. far as the rules go, and for the judging, so long as you're in line with the sixty percent Canadian ingredients that were grown, raised, or produced here. Um, your interpretation of how you use that 40% of the balance, but then also you is up to you. Um, and the 60% of Canadian ingredients can be processed in an ethnic or diverse way, right? So if you want to use a technique that is ethnic, if you want to use a cooking um, tool, anything like that, like that's fine. It can be a completely, we'll say Asian dish using 60% Canadian ingredients. That's totally fine. Okay, perfect. And uh, our uh, other question was about uh, the using elements over a molecular cuisine. Is there any regulation uh, on this, or it's totally free? Uh, no, that they're fine to use because they're for you know um, general purchase, right? A home cook um, has access to them. They're definitely more specialty. So you'll just, as Jennifer was saying, like with the deep frying, right? You may want to give you know a good amount of detailed instructions if you're doing that um, because it's not common knowledge, right? A julienne is a julienne, right? Somebody can Google it if they're not 100% sure, you know, the thick, the thickness and the length of the cut, but something, um, you know, that's more molecular gastronomy, you're going to need to provide the details. So with your two page limit for your recipe copy, just weigh that, you know, into consideration too, right? So how much you know, advanced technique can you incorporate into your two pages of recipe copy and still get across all of the other things you need to include and in your ingredients. So just, you know, that'll be up to you guys to gauge. But um, basically, if somebody can purchase it and they don't need 
you know, a combi oven or, you know, what have you, um, it's fine. It's permitted for sure. Thank you. I see a question from Monique. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, me and my team were thinking of doing a home style dinner accessible to home cooks. And I was wondering if the plates are gonna be judged if harshly if they look less chefy. Like, you know, not as put together. Um, well, I think, you know what? As long as everything um, coordinates well. Um, so if you have, you know, I wouldn't do a home cook, um, you know, meal for a family of four and put, you know, crazy garnish like microgreens and flowers on it. Um, so I think if your whole package, um, you know, is targeted to that audience, um, presentation has to be, you know, presentation is judged. Um, Sabrina, do we give out the, the breakdown of the judging? I can't remember. Uh, yes, I did share the scorecards with everybody so you can see okay. the different elements that the judges will be using okay. to come up with their scores. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as your, your presentation, you know, meets what you think, um, you know, that the judges are going to look for, um, and as long as the whole message, so your whole package and your whole message goes together. So, you know, don't try and do a, you know, casual family dinner of four and then realize, oh, I need to make it look chefy um, and then make that look chefy because that's just not reality. Um, you know, so I think as long as, uh, Sabrina, maybe you have a different take on this, but um, as long as the, the ingredients and the introduction, the lead and the introduction and the recipe um, and the photo all you know, support the same message. I, I think that, you know, that's fine. Um, I will tell you, you know, if you look back, have we got the videos and things on, um, on the Taste Canada website? Yeah. So um, you, and, the, and the Instagram and stuff. So that, that's do my look at what, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do look at what, what the um, student chefs have entered in the past, um, because that's what you're going to be competing against. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, um, it, you know, maybe doing macaroni and cheese, uh, you know, with a squiggle of ketchup isn't going to cut it for this competition. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. There's, if you go onto the Taste Canada website, we have the last three years of the Cooks Books events on the site where you can see the plated dishes. And if you go onto the Instagram, there's also video footage of the past events. And again, the recipe copy is on the Taste Canada blog. So you have access to all previous years, not all, but the most recent previous years to see what students have submitted. Um, and so while, you know, it doesn't need to be you know, you guys are, are training to become professionals, right? So nobody's expecting you to put out a plate that we would see, you know, at the Olympics, but you are training to be professionals. So the judges will have that in mind when, when they're scoring. So, you know, again, try to find that balance, but I would definitely say do your homework, take a look at what's been submitted in the past and, you know, use that as your yardstick when you're trying to, you know, determine whether or not you hit the mark. And again, to Jennifer's point, consistency across all elements of your submission is going to be really key too, because it shows the judges that you've really thought through your idea from start to finish, right? And um, as a chef, that of course is crucial, right? So um, yeah, I would just take a look and see what they what the other students have done in the past. They're really great. That was a good question, Monique. Do you have another question? By the way, Monique and Thomas, they're um, competing for <coughs> Thistletown this year. Um, and we are the um, only high school in the competition. So we got our work cut out for us, but we've, we're feeling good. So, um, Monique, get, uh, do you have another you'll get question? You'll get some ideas this weekend at your event. <laughs> yes, yeah. We're going to be looking at lots of different chefs and their creations. So that'll certainly give us a, a hand as well. Uh, do you have another question, Monique? She seems to have disappeared, actually. Maybe she got kicked out. Um, she let me s okay i'll text her and see if i can get her back in i know she had a couple of questions so okay, let me see yeah, if i can her. get her back in okay we'll go um Sorry, jennifer if i can pipe in 
I have yeah. questions from Caitlin. She's typed them and sent them to me. So yeah, I just I saw that. While we wait for Monique. So she says here, for an alternative to a protein or dairy gluten product, should the alternative be mentioned in the chef's notes or in the recipe itself? Good question. Good question. Um, if it's something that can be easily interchanged, so if you want to call for, um, you know, plain yogurt or silken tofu, and it's a direct interchange, that can go in the ingredients list. So if you put your plain yogurt in the blender um, and the same thing technique works with the, the silken yogurt, you put that in the blender in the exact same time in the exact same place, that can go in the ingredients list. So you would call for a half a cup of you know plain yogurt or silken tofu. If there's a different treatment needed, so if you're giving, um, say, chicken, um, but your um, alternative is cubed tofu, so your chicken is going to need a different cooking technique, um, and it's going to need a different cooking time and a different cooking doneness if, than your tofu. So in that case, I would put the tofu as a variation in the cook's note. Um, because then what you say is, you know, here's my main recipe with my chicken and you, you know, you cook it and you, until it's no longer pink or whatever your temperature it is. Um, if your tofu is your alternative in, in the, um, cook's notes, that's what we call them, Sabrina, or a tip, variation tip, cook's notes. Hi. <laughs> I I work on a lot of different editing and everybody has a different style to what to what we call, them. We call it chef's notes. Chef's notes. Okay. Chef's so in your chef's notes, then you would say, you know, substitute um 375 gram package of tofu, cut into pieces, and add in step three instead of the chicken. Um so if there's a different technique needed, if it's a little more complex, then that goes into the chef's notes. If it's a direct interchange, that can go in the ingredients list. Okay. Another question from Kong Bon. Yes, we had the last question uh, over the use of uh, grease, uh, grease oil. Um, uh, so we both know that uh, canola oil is the main star of the show, but we also wondering that that regardless of butter and olive oil, is there any type of grease elements that is authorized or not? So uh, for the competition, um, the only fats permitted are canola oil or up to two tablespoons of sesame oil. And the sesame oil is because there's really no flavor substitute for sesame. Um, and so, yeah, so canola, you can do a variety of things with it. So um, you're able to use it in just about any creative application. Um, and then if you feel like you really need that toasted sesame flavor, you can use two tablespoons up to um, of sesame oil. And it can be plain canola oil or it can be the cold pressed canola oil, right? right? Correct. Yep. And then uh, margarine, uh, because uh, we are, because apparently it's composed by uh, canola oil. So is there margarine or rice or not? Margarine? Yeah. Um, I, we've never had. We've never had that. I've never Lin, had Lin, they ask. Um, Lynn, Lynn, what's your? Um, most margarine is made with canola oil because it is a very healthy oil and it is low in saturated fat. So most margarines like basil will use canola oil. So I would think that would be fine. I, I mean, think it's just up as, to you, as long as Sabrina and Karen, but that makes sense to me that it is still using canola oil. As long as it's one that is, you know, canola oil and, and you'd have to specify that. So in your ingredients list, you would say, you know, a quarter cup um, canola, canola oil margarine. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it, uh, kudos to you. First time we've ever been asked that question. So um, if that is the unanimous decision, I will make sure that I let the judges know that. So that way, when they're reviewing your recipe, um, they understand that it's permitted. And I will incorporate into future events where um, we say that um, 
canola based uh, margarine is permitted. So that's great. Yeah, good question. If you are looking at doing pastry. We do have, because I know that's a challenge when you only have oil. Um, you can make oil based pastry, but we do have a really good recipe on our Canola Eat Well site that uses, that has you freeze the canola oil to use it like um, another hard fat in your pastry. So that might be something that you want to look at as well. You freeze the canola oil so it's really, really cold and then you can grate it in just like you would do butter or lard or shortening. Yeah, that's, that's such a fun technique. It's bizarre. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very cool. Um, so did Caitlin have more questions? She did. She did. She has okay. one more question. Uh, it has to do with the copywriting. So she says for cups or for using cups, I've seen a capital C being used instead of the whole word cup. Is this correct? Um, do we have that in our style guide? Um, and we don't have <laughs> that necessarily per se, but what we do yeah. have is, um, no, actually we do. We do. Yeah. Because we do identify here. Um, we, we say in all of our examples, we write out the word cup or cups. Yeah. We never yeah. use the capital C. Um, and then in the, um, example recipe that we've given everybody, it also uses the whole word cups with a lowercase C. Um, mm. Nothing is capitalized. The T on tablespoon is not capitalized. The C on cup is not capitalized. So yeah. um, that is, that's our Taste Canada um, style. style. And the reason being on that one, Caitlin, um, especially, and sometimes you'll just see the capital T for tablespoon or the lowercase T for, for teaspoon, um, that can get confusing when people are in the kitchen. So what you um, want to look at is when you're standing kitchen, you're looking down at a, at a, I have a magazine right here. So I'm looking down at the magazine and I'm trying to follow a recipe. And if it's vague um, and it's just a capital T or a lowercase T, that's a bad mistake if somebody puts in a tablespoon of salt instead of a teaspoon of salt. Um, when it's written out, it's much more clear and there's no question about it. So um, that's one of the things that's a really good question. Um, and that's cool. Those are things are called style questions. So it's a style guide that different um, publications will will put out um, and a publisher will have a different style and, a, you know, different different places you read things have different styles. But the, the written out cups is absolutely much more clear um and so it's always just better to to make it as clear as possible for the for the cook yeah and again i would say reference the recipe that's attached to the um back of the rules and regulations that recipe was selected because it represents all of the different kinds of measures there's weight measures volume measures um you know, um, unit measures, and it shows you the different ways that to call for it according to our style guide, which is what the judges will be using to score your recipe copy. So um, yeah, just take a look there. And if you have a measurement that isn't um, in that example recipe and you're unclear, go ahead and email me and I'll, um, um, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, Keith, uh, if if, if Monica or Monique doesn't, oh, there she is. She's back. Okay. Um, Emery, did you have questions or were they answered already? Hi. Hi. I have a question. Yes. Uh, who is our target audience for this competition? Is a professor or home cook or for a student? Yes. So it's home cook, and but somebody that that's me, you know, really into food and, and, a, and a, you know, avid home cook, sort of somebody that likes things a little bit elevated. So you can get a little more adventurous and, and technical, um, but it's still somebody at home with home equipment. Um, you know, they don't have a salamander. They, they have a 
broiler under the oven. Um, they don't have, you know, like I said in my video, they probably don't have five large pots they can use all at once. So, um, but they might have, you know, three or four different sizes of pots because they're, they're really into cooking. So it's somebody that's more into cooking. Um, they, at, um, than sort of, you know, average, but, but definitely somebody at home. Okay, thank you very much. Also, I have one more question. Uh, sure. Can you give us an example of what recipe introduction should be? The recipe introduction, yeah. So we talked about that, and that's um, that's like your sales pitch or your selling point. So you want to entice, you want to encourage people to make your recipe. So you want to tell them what's great about your recipe, what's different about your recipe. Is your recipe, um, you know, is say everybody makes a lasagna, but you're making your lasagna with butternut squash in it. So tell me that. Um, tell me what's special or unique or um, extra good about your recipe and why, if I'm flipping through a stack of recipes, I want to choose yours. So really sell it to me in that, you know, couple of lines and also give us any key information that will help us find an ingredient or help us, you know, decide whether or not to make that recipe. So another helpful thing is, um, you know, sometimes I'll write in my ingredients or my introductions, you know, this recipe takes a little planning, start the sauce the day ahead so that you're ready to assemble things the next day. So give them a little bit of coaching as to how to approach that recipe if something really needs to be made ahead. Um, if if uh, an element tastes way better, if it sits, you know, if you're making a pickle, so you're making a pickled garnish, say make the pickle, you know, two or three days ahead to get the maximum flavor the day you're gonna serve it. So you can in, include that in your in your coaching and, and selling point. Don't put that at the bottom of the recipe, um, you know, and like, you know, after after you've made all the other ingredients, don't say, oh, and by the way, you should have made your pickles two days ahead. Because by step number seven, it's too late for that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Also, okay. also my teammate, Shao Mei, has a question. Is it okay? Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the ingredients list. Uh, in the okay, the example recipe, uh, we have the uh, first list the impairing matter, and the, in the parathens, we have the metric matter, right? Um, but if I use the metric matter first sometimes it's difficult to transfer to the impairing matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sabrina, you can speak to this. I think oh. you're asking about equivalence, right? So if you have yeah. the imperial and then you need the metric, um, again, you can, uh, there's a good variety of um, measurements in the example recipe, but if what you're finding isn't there, you can Google it, um, or you can, um, again, look back to maybe some previous recipes that Cooks the Books winners, or I would say look at the winners um, and see what, their rec what they use for equivalence. But there's also standard measurements, right? So um, one tablespoon is 15 milliliters. Therefore, two tablespoons is 30 milliliters. So if you can find um, a fraction of what it is you're trying to figure out, take the um, equivalent that's there for you and then extrapolate from that. So then kind of do the math to figure out what the equivalent might be. Um, yeah. Okay. One, one that's tricky that comes up, I, I find a lot is 100 mils or 200 mils because half a cup is 125 mils. So the 100 mils is kind of in between. So, um, cause a, a third of a cup is 80, 75 or 80 mils, depending on who you ask. So, um, then I would go to, you know, you can break it into tablespoons, um, and, and get as close as you can. Um, if possible, so sometimes I'll look at a recipe when I'm editing and, and somebody's called 200 mils. And I look at it and say, so that's three quarters of a cup is 175 mils. So 
could this recipe work with just three quarters of a cup and then just change it to 175 mils and try it that way? If it absolutely doesn't work um, with three quarters of a cup and you really need that extra um, amount, does it work with 205 mils? Because then we can say three quarters of a cup plus two tablespoons. So that would equal 205 mils. So get as close as you can on, on the um, equivalents. Measuring out three quarters of a cup plus two tablespoons is a bit tedious. Um, measuring out 205 mils is a bit tedious. But so that's why it'd be really great if it worked with three quarters of a cup. But if it doesn't, then you can, you know, sort of have those plus amounts. Um, one of the things is most home cooks average in Canada use cups and tablespoons. Um, it, it's old fashioned and not as accurate, but that's, that's is ingrained in our society. So um, one of the things when I'm recipe developing for the home cook, I start with cups and tablespoons, and then it's easier to do the metric equivalents based on the tables. Um, and uh, and it, it's not ideal, and it would be great if everybody cooked in metric and weights because it would be much more accurate. Um, and it's not so clunky when you're writing, but it, that's, you know, that's the way it is. So try and try and do as close as an equivalent um, as, as you can, trying to use kind of more round, nice numbers when, when possible. Okay, I think, I think Monique's back and she can ask oh, another perfect. question, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. Were you done, show me? Yes, thank you. Yes, okay. Yeah, hi. Um, Monique. Uh, my next question is, we were thinking it's going to be kind of hard to fit all the instructions into the recipe. So I was wondering if you'd have any tips for shortening the methods without skimping on the details. <laughs> Again, that's the million dollar question. Um, when, when you're writing for magazines, lots of times have to you have to really squeeze those words in when when they tell you there's only a certain amount of space so um, sometimes it takes making your recipe more simple you know maybe don't do eight different elements um, again think about your stars your recipe and think about your accents and maybe if you're finding your recipe is way too long maybe one of the accents might have to go. Um, one of the things what you want to think about when you're talking to your audience and we're talking to our avid home cooks, how much time are they willing to spend in the kitchen um, to make a meal and put it on the table? If there are so many elements and such intricate um, instructions that it's more than two pages, is anybody going to make that recipe? Um, so that's, again, a very big difference from making a, a meal you're going to put on a restaurant menu. You could fire all those elements as long as you've got the staff in the back of the house to, to do them. Um, you know, you can put as many elements on a plate as you want. However, at home, are people going to do those? So if your recipe is getting a lot more complex, um, and you think it's not going to fit on two pages, maybe take a look at it and see maybe it doesn't need to be that complex. Maybe it doesn't quite need so many ingredients. Um, it's kind of a fascinating fact that when, when you're working for a company like um, Kraft or uh, one of the big food companies, there's like this five to seven ingredient thing. People, home cooks making an average home meal don't want to use more than five to seven ingredients. They don't want to bother. It's too long. It looks too complicated. So um, it gets really confining to try and make recipes taste great with that few ingredients. We're not expecting you to do, you know, five to seven ingredients. Um, but if you're finding that you can't fit your recipe onto two pages, it may be that the recipe and the elements are too complicated. Um, when you're writing the, the methods, um, include the, the keywords. So stirring, you know, boiling, cooking time, you can't take any of those out, but you can take it words like the and of the, and, you know, sort of those extraneous, those extra words that, um, that we use in regular language. And 
it, it, when you start trimming those out, it's actually kind of amazing how much space you can you can save. So um, it you know it's not going to save ten lines or anything, but it can save some and um, and keep your keep your wording more condensed. But make sure you're keeping those important words that you're coaching. Because remember when we talked about in the workshop, you're coaching somebody to make this recipe. So if there's important words that you need to coach them, don't take those ones out. Does that help? Yes, thank you. That was a good that was a good question, Monique. Yeah, is that do you have another one or is that is that it? No, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. I was gonna say I have one other tip that will save you a whole line. Um, just be careful when and where you use it. If you have two or three ingredients that are the same volume or the same weight and get used in the same place in the technique of the recipe, you may put them on the same line. So what I mean by that is you can say a quarter cup, 60 milliliters, each finely chopped parsley, chives, and tarragon. And that saves you from having to do three separate lines for the three different herbs, but you must incorporate those three herbs at the same time in the recipe. You can't put the parsley, you know, in with the marinade and then the chives to, you know, go in with your potato and then, you know, the tarragon in with your sauce and you're making them at different times because that will be an incorrectly written recipe. But like I said, if they're all the same amount and they're going in at the same time, you can put it on one line and you have to include the word each before you start listing the ingredients or the modifier, the chopped, finely chopped, that kind of thing. Yeah. Sometimes if you end up adding all the modifiers, if they're not uh, all the same modifier, you end up going to two lines anyway, doesn't save you. But, you know, if you have to say sliced onion, finely chopped celery, and julienne carrot, that might drop a line. So just kind of weigh it out. But, um, but it, it does, uh, that does, that's a good trick. <laughs> Did we miss anybody? Hi, actually, I have one more question. Is it okay? Of course. Yeah. Thank you. If we are making play sub, is it okay to have the recipe make more than we require if we add a suggestion for years? No. Um, if there's a suggestion for use and it's something that keeps, um, you know, it's okay to do that. But most people want each element to make the right so um, if you are making crab cakes and vegetables um, and you're serving it with, a, you know, a spicy mayonnaise and I'm serving four people, I don't need three cups of spicy mayonnaise because if you're putting two tablespoons on the plate, what am I going to do, you know, as a home cook with the rest, you know, two and a half cups more of spicy mayonnaise? And then I think, oh, I wasted all that ingredients. Um, if there's something that you, you can't possibly um, scale down for just, just the amount that you need, um, you can say, use half a cup of this, but then you need to tell me what to do with the rest of it. You can't just let it be there in the air. Um, and then I'm, I'm left with my, my thing and I'm like, oh, what, what was I supposed to do with this? So you can say, you know, reserve a half cup for serving, any extra can be refrigerated and stored for up to three weeks. And then in your chef's tip, um, your chef's note, you can say, use the extra spicy mayonnaise and make tuna salad sandwiches or something like that. But you have to address the extra because when a judge or a recipe editor is reading that, um, they're going to say, well, you only used half a cup, but I can tell that's going to make three cups. Like, you know, that's a waste. So it's better to have it all fit and have all of the components make the, the right amount for what you need. But if there's not, as long as you address it um, and tell people what, what to do with it and tell people that they're going to expect to have extra. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, Samantha? Yes, I just had a quick question. Um, on the... Uh, the links that you gave us for direction. Um, there was a link for the seasonality of vegetables and fruits that were in season. Um, are we also allowed to use the Foodland Ontario site as well? Because there seemed to be a lot more seasonality with that list compared to the one that was linked in the email. Sabrina? 
Yeah, so there are lots of lists out there and depending on where they're from, um, you know, they can vary. Foodland Ontario is Ontario specific and we're a national competition. So that's why we went with Canadian Food Focus because again, it's talking primarily about, you know, across the country. So that is the one that the judges will be vetting against, you're vetting your recipes against. So um, I can understand why, you know, um, it might be alluring to go to a list that has more options. We are using the Canadian um, food focus list as our, our primary source for um, what we consider a Canadian ingredient to fall under the 60% bracket. So that's where you should be looking. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Jesse? Hi, I just um, haven't asked the questions for my... Um, oh, okay, for, sorry. <laughs> um, Daniel and I were from Conestoga and he just wanted me to ask a question. Are we limited Perfect. to fall and winter ingredients or if we can find a place that can get us, um, like, like, I can't think of something like in the moment, but like a specific thing of mushrooms that grows in like middle of summer, if we could find that, are we limited to or do we have to use all fall ingredients? You should be referencing the Canadian food focus list for fall and winter um, because we do kind of work right on the, on, you know, the, the balance between the two seasons, but, um, and there are farmhouse ingredients that are available, you know, all year long and those are included on those lists. Um, but, um, or hothouse ingredients, pardon me, but yeah, if it has to be on the Canadian food focus list for fall and for winter, cause we are um, looking for seasonal recipes. Thank you. Question. And did you have another one? No. I had a few more, but they got answered. Oh, perfect. It's, it's fun how uh, everybody had the same similar questions. Okay. Lynn, is there anything else you want to um, put out there? Just for for their recipe development uh for canola ways you know any any tips tricks well Jen, uh, jennifer after listening to you i'm just so excited and i can't wait to see all the recipes that everyone comes up with i like the Me too. i love that you're using canadian ingredients that's of course close to my heart um as i do work for the farmers that grow canola in canada so that's very exciting and i think you know looking at really what we what foods we can get in canada that are healthy and that are sustainable really makes sense and i think that's an an area that we should be focusing in on so supporting what we do grow in canada so that's very exciting to me um i know that it's tricky just using canola oil and that's what makes this recipe contest even a little bit more challenging and, and exciting but i really do thank you for choosing to use canola oil in your recipes it is just so versatile that you can use it for so many applications it's not just for frying it's not just for baking it's not just for deep frying it can be used for all of those applications and that really is different than any other fat um, so that is what makes a canola oil versatile and again if you're someone who you know really wants to limit the ingredients that are on your shelf well canola oil is perfect because you can uh, use it for all sorts of applications so i'm really excited to see what you guys do i know you're going to do some amazing things um this is not you know canola eat well has been involved with the cook the books for many years and every year what you, the students, come up with is just really awe-inspiring and it's so exciting. So I absolutely can't wait to see what you do. And with Jen, Jennifer's great instructions, um, I, 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 I feel like I want to write a cookbook right now. And I'm thinking about some of the things that I've done wrong before in the past. So thanks for all of that great information, Jennifer. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and just one quick thing about you know reading cookbooks and and reading magazines. Um, look at some of the some of the winners. Um, Taste Canada Awards cookbooks. Um, we have all our winners on the um, on the website. And one good tip I would say because sometimes I I honestly I get recipes from people um, you know professionals, but I like I'll 
edit and I'm like, have you ever read a recipe before? Um, <laughs> and, um, and look at some of the winning cookbooks. You can find them on online libraries mm -hmm. a lot of times. So, um, or even at your, you know, go to a real library where they have books. Um, it's kind of an interesting concept. Um, but check out some of the Taste Canada award winners and read those recipes. So find a recipe that's similar maybe to what you're working on and get some get some tips and definitely that's a good way to to read the introductions and find out about introductions because there's some really great introductions like if you read an introduction and your mouth is watering and you're like I want to go into my kitchen right now and make that recipe that's a good introduction so that's a good way to do it is look at some of our Taste Canada award winners and um, read those recipes and get familiar um, with with the style and the and the way that they they write the recipes because recipe writing for you know for writing down is very very different from just making a recipe to to cook you know to serve customers uh, well, I agree with you, Jennifer. And for all of the students out there, Jennifer's books are extremely well written. So her recipes are really gold standard. So um, <laughs> if you are looking for some recipe inspiration, Jennifer has many, many books out there. And she's written for many years for many different magazines. So if you were to Google her name, all sorts of recipes are going to come up. And she really <laughs> is a pro. And Canadian recipe writers are really special. We write great recipes. When, you know, I have friends that are looking for recipes online, you know, you can see a difference. Our recipes in Canada are just, our recipe developers are just, recipe developers are just so good at what they do. So choose Canadian ingredients and Canadian recipes. I see Rennie, have you managed to find your student? I, I can't see seconds, Rennie. I'll just go, uh, I'm just going to okay. exit the Oh, screen. there you are. No, she okay. uh, hasn't gotten back, but the uh, we are going to be sending, there is going to be a link sent out for the recording, is there? Yes. Yeah, okay, I think that should be good. Okay. Gino, I don't know, do you have anything? Is he still here? You're good? Yeah. Great mm -hmm. questions by everyone involved again. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I love, I love how much. Oh, May. Um, hi, it's really last question. It's, it's a little tricky part is what if we do our recipes and we cook, for example, right? We may have bacon in our recipes. And when we cook that, we get the fat from that. I don't, you know, like, what should I do? Can I cook with that? And is that mm -hmm. count mm -hmm. or? So I just like put that fat apart and you canola mm. oil instead. Right. So if it's rendered off. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of tricky. I know, but yeah, I think, I think we can't exclude that because it's, it's naturally in the, in the food. So um, as long as you're not, um, so you can't cook bacon and use the bacon fat, but not use the bacon. So, no, no, no. you know, don't, don't cook some, you know, pancetta, render out the fat, get rid of the pancetta and use the pancetta fat. Um, but if you're browning your, your meat um, and fat renders out, but usually you would use canola to start with anyway, you would put a little bit of oil in to start with. Um, so I would say, you know, use your judgment, but, um, you know, don't, don't drain off all of the natural fat that came out of your meat um, just for the sake of using canola, because I think that, you know, that speaks to sort of efficiency and, and you know. And waste as well, right? So, waste, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, you know, as Jennifer said, you'd likely use a little bit of canola to do your searing or, you know, um, your coating of a rub or, you know, a marinade, what have you, right? And then once you cook your protein, you are going to have drippings that come off of that, right? So um, if you need them to then make your pan sauce or your reduction, what have you, that's totally fine. If you have to drain some off because you don't need it, you don't want it to be greasy, that's okay. Um, but if you need to add more fat in, then, you know, maybe that's a good spot for canola there, right? But no, don't feel like you have to completely discard any rendered fat in order to bring the canola in. So, because we don't want to waste, right? That's naturally occurring. It's flavor. It's all those great things. So we don't want that to go into the, into the waste bin. 
Thank you so much. I just want to, you know, clear that part because I don't want to make mm -hmm. a mistake on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I'm trying to see hands. Um, I've been keeping track and I think we've heard from everybody. Did we hear from students at uh, Assiniboine? Just wasn't sure. Yeah, Emily and Charming. Okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah, so I think we've heard from everybody, but um, last call, if anybody else has any more questions or any more follow-up questions. No. No? Okay. Well, and it's 17, so I think that's right about perfect. Uh, one um, other thing we haven't touched on, it's not necessarily about your recipe, um, but it is about the video that you're going to submit along with your elements. Um, this is your chance to kind of have, um, you know, introduce yourself to the judges. Um, you're not scored on it, so don't worry about, you know, production value and, you know, all of those things. But this is a good chance to, like I said, introduce yourself, the school you're from, and um, kind of give that personal touch and that, you know, um, provide the inspiration for your recipe. And Anything that maybe didn't land in the recipe copy, um, you know, in your lead and your sales pitch that you think might be interesting or relevant to them. Not so much for the success of the recipe, but just again, a way to introduce yourself to the judges. So, um, yeah, so just that, and it's a chance to kind of share your passion for, for the recipe that you've created and, uh, and let them know kind of uh, where it came from and, and, you know, how excited you are about it and, and, you know, your experience in the kitchen and developing the recipe and, uh, and, you know, maybe some of the things you learn so that's another good spot to uh, to include a little bit of a personal touch we have those past ones on i think they're on instagram they're right. fun to watch because uh yeah so definitely watch some of those to get some ideas because there's some some fun ones out there hmm. oh i saw another hand up and then it patrick uh, yeah it? yeah i think i I think my, I'm <laughs> my, uh, <laughs> my my little boxes keep jumping around. Sorry, so I, I, I was just <laughs> I was just saying like we're we're gonna be if we shoot our video in our in the school environment like with I'm just thinking about masks and COVID and all of that like that, that's not mm. gonna but you mentioned that it's not gonna be scored right so yeah I might I may not it may not really be anything I need to worry about, I guess. <laughs> like, you know cause what? you're not, yeah, you have to talk well, through yeah, them, right? so, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've seen some great outdoors ones, actually. Some, right. some of the ones mm -hmm. that stick in my mind were, were mm -hmm. done outdoors way pre-COVID. So, right. um, you know, that's that's also an option to, right. to kind of do a little more, a little, little outdoorsy segment. Um, is also usually better liked. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Okay. Sabrina? All right. Well, I think that's a wrap, everybody. Um, you know, thank you again to everybody for making yourselves available and coming with such amazing questions. Um, really, truly, we're already so impressed by all of the students and the effort and the enthusiasm you've shown for the competition. We're just really grateful and really, really impressed. So um, it's always um, so... Um, awe-inspiring Lynn said it we're truly is when the recipes come in and we're looking at them look like, I'm so glad I'm not a judge and I have to I don't I don't have to pick the winner because um it seems almost impossible because the talent is just off the charts and you guys are on to already off to such a great start so um thank you again to all the students you know all of the chef faculty who is leading them and training them and supporting them um and answering all of my emails. Uh, we really appreciate your time and extra effort um, in, in um, you know, seeing them through this experience. So, um, you know, to Jennifer, your expertise is, you know, um, second to none. So thank you so much for, again, sharing it with all of us tonight and with all the students in the workshop. Um, I really hope that, uh, and I think that it will make a really big difference in their, um, their development process. I think that it's really given them a leg up. So thank you. Perfect. And to Lynn and Canola, of course, thank you so much for making all of this possible. Um, we're, uh, again, very grateful to, to, um, be partners with with canola and uh, and be exposed to all of this amazing talent the culinary future of Canada um, mm -hmm. you know possibly future cookbook writers so we're um, yeah. just thrilled thrilled and uh, 
If you have any questions, please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I do my best to respond as fast as possible because I know that you guys have really full plates, no pun intended. Um, so, but yeah, <laughs> do not hesitate if you need anything. So um, yeah, and again, thank you to everybody. Thank you. I'm so excited to see what you come up with. Me too. All right, well, um, I think that's a good night and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank okay. You. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Have a good Thanks night, again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.